Hey, this is Jonah with Gray Area. Welcome to our series Spotlight, where our mission is to build a bigger and more united house music community by sharing new and exciting artists, festivals, and event brands with you. In this interview, you'll hear from Ghetto Blaster, veterans of the Chicago rave scene who are bringing their unique brand of house music to stages all across the world. Be sure to like this video and subscribe for more interviews like this. I, I'd never had the chance to see you guys play before, and then I saw you at uh, Chris Lake, and it was obviously really awesome, and you know, people came out in the rain, and I just kind of wanted to jump off there and just ask you guys about you know, what it's been like kind of returning to shows after such a long break. And then also, you know, having the opportunity to play at a venue like that, you know, in a yeah. city like New York. Well, it was crazy for us right out the gate. Cause we had, we, we had come off the pandemic, me and him did not, cause I have underlining conditions. And uh, so we didn't want to go out until we got vaccinated. So like we were turning down all our shows to that point. And then our first show back was the Dirty Bird Camping in Orlando. It was our first time back. And the wow. day we land, the president is like, you can take your mask off if you're vaxxed. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> so, like, so, so for a year, we've been told if you don't wear a mask, you're going to die. And now you're like, here's 4,000 people, no masks. <laughs> So, so it's been kind of crazy. It was kind of a mind fuck. I'm not going to lie to you. It was pretty crazy. And like, you know, we got it to the point where we're like, okay, we're breathing. It seems cool. Two days have gone by. We're fine. So it took a while to get used to coming back. I think, you know what I mean? As far as all that goes. And, uh, and then, you know, like the Brooklyn Mirage, what an amazing venue that is. I don't think I spent any time inside. So, you know what I mean? I think I was in the trailer, but outside of that, it was all open air. So you, I feel real comfortable in situations like that. Yeah, for sure. So oh, we, don't, we, we don't generally, I mean, I'm a little too heavy to be crowd surfing, so I'm, I'm not <laughs> worried about that so much. <laughs> I, I could just imagine their faces if I jumped. <laughs> oh, my God. That's, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but there's this great video of Shaquille O'Neal on the Phoenix Suns, and he like goes to jump for a ball in the crowd, and his entire bench just clears out. Oh, my God. <laughs> Can you imagine if that guy smashed you? Holy shit. Yeah, really. That'd be terrible. <laughs> yeah. I think you're going to be yeah, a so stiff It's been, it's been crazy coming back, though. But we we full four since we played our first show. We've played two to three shows a week since then. So I think we desensitized ourselves. And it's going to be weird going back because, like, this weekend we're doing uh, – Denver, we're doing Las Vegas, we're doing LA, and in certain areas, like masks are required inside again now. So when we go to Vegas, we're gonna have to put a mask on. So, oh wow! When this first happened too, it was like uh, with the Orlando and everything, we were still wearing masks, even though people were like basically telling us not to wear masks. Like, what are you guys doing wearing masks? Like, man, like <laughs> <laughs> been doing this for a year. Like, I'm, I'm not really ready just to give it up like that because they say so you yeah know? yeah we had we had a, other headliners coming up to us they were like dude yeah, take the exactly. mask off bro <laughs> <laughs> so. oh my god yeah man florida is uh kind of doing its own thing this whole time you know florida is its own country yeah. bro let's just leave it there <laughs> <laughs> oh, no I, I, that's that's absolutely correct um no I, I mean it's been very interesting you know ho hopefully hopefully we keep the positive momentum going. I think I would, it would obviously really suck if we have to take a step back, but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do what's necessary. I know in New York, they're kind of what I think they're doing now is something that I, I, I wish we did a while ago, which is instead of kind of reinforcing or bringing back these mask mandates, we're now saying, if you want to eat at restaurants, you have to get vaccinated. Um, and just laying down the law on that. And, you know, not everywhere is going to do the same thing, but I wanted to just kind of go back a little and I was wondering if you guys could just give me a little background um, on how the two of you met and, you know, what kind of drew you together. So we, we rewind to like years before the late nineties, early two thousands. I used to have my own career separately. I was, I was a Chicago mixtape guy. I worked in record stores. I put out mixed actual physical mixtapes. I sold like a hundred thousand mixtapes in three years and I was playing the rave circuit pretty heavily. And he used to be a rave promoter, so he used to book me all the time. So that we <laughs> we stayed friends for for years, and you know, randomly through a bunch of different transformations in our careers, we happened to be in Miami one weekend for the Miami Music Week, and I was like done with everything. I was like, dude, I am done doing all this kind of music because I was doing everything from like electro to like I've been on subliminal records on. Uh, 
on all these different things, like a little bit of electro, a little bit of a disco house, a little bit. Of, I was very confused in what I was doing. So I was like, you know what? I want to go back to, cause I'm from Chicago. He's from Detroit. So I was like, I grew up in the warehouse. That's where we met. And I go, we should do more of what we used to do, but with a new fresh edge. And it was funny because last minute I got booked for a party at 11-11, the rooftop. And it was a total dubstep party. It was like Kennedy Jones. It was like 12th Planet. And my buddy's like, hey, man, I know you fuck around with Trap. Do you want to come do a set? I was like, sure. And I got there. I was like, dude, I am not doing this. I was like, I am not playing Trap. He's like, I hate this stuff. And just because I'm good at producing it does not mean I want to do this. And I told him, I go, watch me fuck these people up. And I played the percolator. <laughs> that was awesome. And literally oh we looked at each other. I go, we should start doing house music again. And that's how we started. That, that's how the ghetto blaster began was, was that party. I played the percolator and all the dubstep kids were like, yeah, we're like, all right, cool. Time for a change. <laughs> so that's that, really that was how we decided to start ghetto blaster. So yeah. I was, I always feel like every uh, bass festival needs a house stage. Cause those people like, they don't know it, but they sneaky like might be into it. Um, you know, as you just alluded to, you guys are from kind of the meccas and the the homes of house and techno. And I think nowadays it maybe flies under the radar. I'm personally not super plugged into those scenes, but because you, you know, as you just mentioned, you were guys were pretty deep in the rave circuit. I'm wondering if you could just expand on that a little, kind of what that yeah. scene was like back then and what it means to you to still be in it today. I mean, honestly, back then, I mean, <clears throat> when we were hanging out at, at Brooklyn Mirage, we came with one of our old rave friends. We came with Tommy Sunshine, actually. So I saw, so saw like, him. Yeah. 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 So that was kind of, that was definitely an, oh, that's how you could tell we've been in the game for a minute because we're friends with, that have been legends for 30 years. You know what I mean? So, and still relevant to this day. And uh, so basically then was like, I mean, down to like the, you wouldn't know exactly where the party was. And it sounds so cliche. I feel like I'm telling you an episode of Friends or something when, when Phoebe went to a rave. <laughs> like basically like you would, you would have to, you didn't know where you were going. If you weren't, if you were from in town, you had to find the rave. And it was like, we would be like within blocks and I have to roll my window down. I'm like, I hear bass that way, go that way. You know what I mean? Like we had to like find the party. It was, I, I played a bunch in New York like that too. That were pretty crazy. Like I played, I played a couple parties under bridges in New York, all kinds of weird places. And that was the thing. They were always like not legit venues and you had to find them. And it, there was like an excitement about that. So it's like nowadays it's like, I think the, there's still excitement, but it's different excitement. You know what I mean? So like, I don't know, as far as our music goes, that's, that's dominantly where we're, we're influenced by what happened. Like we're trying to do, music that was popular then like the loops and the like the very loopy tracky style house if you notice during our set that's kind of like what we do a little bit of booty influence too you know because we work with like dj funk and dion and you know a couple of the legends there but we tried to like do that style of music but with build-ups because back then there wasn't build-ups and snare rolls and all these crazy like put your hands in the air kind of it was more of a groove so we're putting the hands in the air to the groove if that makes sense so it, it, like i said that warehouse scene was so different back then you know it yeah, wasn't no, really commercialized either you know they didn't have the light shows like back yeah. back then i would be in a warehouse with seven thousand people there'd be a disco ball yeah exactly <laughs> you know what i mean like about sound and lights yeah <laughs> yeah now like you're at brooklyn mirage build up and drops there's flames there's lasers and that would people would have had a heart attack in the 90s if that happened oh, my God. <laughs> yes so, no, that's, yeah, it was, that's it was great. interesting. It, 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 there's definitely a difference between the two scenes. It was so crazy back then, but, but I'm glad, I'm glad it's more structured. The venues are a little cleaner now too. <laughs> oh yeah. We would be warehouses. I, I remember playing the Marshall Field, Fields warehouse in Chicago. Hadn't been touched in 15 years. And for two weeks I was picking black boogers because it was so dirty and dusty that it was just kicked up in the air. You thought it was a fog machine. No, that shit was dirt. <laughs> So yeah, it, oh, it's man. definitely different. Yeah, that's really funny. Yeah, because they would shut I, off I've, all the water. So oh yeah, like, venues were crazy back then. They were like, you know what? We're not selling enough water. Turn the heat up and shut off, shut off all the faucets. Not only faucets, but toilets sometimes. Oh, they would shut off all the water in the venue so kids couldn't refill their water bottles, which is really gross. I remember yeah. going into a bathroom and it's so I was like, oh, dude, you. there's water in the bathroom. Like, oh my god. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so raves were crazy man like, if you did, if you weren't part of that era 
I guess be thankful and and be sad because it was cool to see, but I definitely did not drink toilet water. <laughs> <laughs> To say the least, but yeah, it was crazy. It was crazy. I, I've been in parties though, but back when they were shutting down raves, where I'm like DJing and the sound system goes on, I'm like, oh fuck, did I blow the sound system? So I just kept my head down. I just kept DJing, and all of a sudden I hear, "Put your hands up!" I'm like, oh shit! And I have like eight machine guns on me. The feds were shutting the parties down. Yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> so yeah, things are different. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, man. Uh, I'll tell you yeah, what. I, the, I didn't know this interview was going to go this way. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. I love to hear this stuff. I mean, you know, for me, I, I obviously, you know, I didn't have the opportunity to experience that. But I, as somebody who now works, you know, both on the media side and as a promoter and a talent buyer, and I DJ myself just for fun, it's like you have to be a student of the game. And it's like, I've seen some of these videos from back in the day, and I think it doesn't even give it justice as to what you guys are describing. And I'm sure oh, there's yeah. pros and cons. Like, I think, you know, there is something to be said about kind of the community that probably existed back then that I do think exists now, but it's different. Oh, yeah. And obviously, as you guys recognize, it's like every now and then you can be at a show and it's like, it feels like the D, you know, people are just having like a big dick contest when it comes to the production, you know, who can have the most lasers, who can have the most fire. And, you know, there's certainly people out there who are doing original creative things. I mean, I'm a big fan of Eric Prids and it's like, when you see what he's doing, oh, it's incredible. you respect that, but you know, there's others. I, I won't say any names, but you kind of know yeah. who I'm talking about where it's just, it's about the show rather than the music. And, uh, you know, there's something to be said about kind of that old school vibe, but there, we, we got a lot of terms and conditions on the contract on the contract now that uh, make all that stuff impossible. You know, just yeah. going back when you guys first got going, I was kind of listening to, you know, the first couple of years of your music, um, whether it was like the original sacks of weed uh, club beats yeah. had kind of that more four on the floor stuff like yeah. streetwise uh, disco was more of a disco track hustling for horns was similar you know, once yeah. you two first started getting into the studio together, what was that process like? Obviously, you mentioned some of your influences, but kind yeah. of trying to find your sound in the beginning and what was influencing you and leading you to go in some different directions. Yeah, so the, when we first started, he was living in Michigan. I was living in Colorado. So it was all through the Internet. And then occasionally he'd fly over to me for a weekend. Yeah, yeah. I would fly over to him for a weekend just to get some FaceTime. And it's funny because. Uh, we did better going back and forth on the internet than we did sitting next to each other. Cause then he comes into town. It's like, Oh, let's go get dinner. Let's get yeah. fucked up. Let's go do this. And it'd be like the last 20 minutes. He's there. I'm like, Oh, we should start something, man. We didn't make any music. <laughs> so, yeah. so eventually the, those weekends turned into, he would come and stay for a week, vice versa. You know what I mean? So <clears throat> I always feel like the vibe is better when we're in the room together. Does that make sense? Like, I feel like just yeah. being, feeding off each other and like just in partnerships in general too. like versus making music on your own. Like when you're writing music, like you hit a wall and then you have fresh years next to you. That's like, Hey, you should try this when you would like, Oh shit, I've been doing this for fucking two hours. I don't even think to try that. You know, it's good to have like a partnership. And again, our influences, you know, obviously early nineties to today. I mean, there's a lot of in incredible artists now that's the one thing that's different from then to now is now i go on a beat port and i'll find a hundred great producers i've never heard of back in the record store there was like 10 new artists every week now there's thousands of every week <laughs> yeah. you know that that's that's, crazy. that's the cool part now is like i think it's people will say always oh, it was better then or it's better now i think it's fucking incredible now the, the level of talent that is coming out like even the party that we played for you guys like from beginning to end was absolutely incredible. It was just all around the board the fun. And what I liked about this party at Brooklyn Barrage, I mean, I've never been to Brooklyn Barrage. Yeah, and, yeah, we've never been there. I, I gave my girlfriend a tour while we were doing sound check on my phone. I go, hey, you got to check this out. Fucking got lost. <laughs> There's nobody in the venue. <laughs> you know? I was like, how do I get this area? I'm like, I got to call you back. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but like that, the vibe for that party was like, was it, it was like a happy medium of like cutting edge and it was like vibey too, like old yeah. school vibes, because there was a lot of moments where the lights weren't all crazy and it was about the music. And then there were the huge moments, you know what I mean? So, you know, I, I, I have a lot of fond memories of that weekend, even in the rain, like it didn't, like rain doesn't matter. That's whatever. 
yeah, people people came out strong that night, and it, I was there. I don't know. I think you guys were maybe there the night before too. And oh. um, that first night was I probably the hottest I've ever experienced a show at that venue. And then just the, but it was still packed out. And then the drastic contrast the next night, it's pouring rain and people just don't care. I'm just wondering, you know, after playing a show like that throughout your career or right now, do you guys have a preference on kind of playing like a large scale venue versus a festival versus maybe more of an intimate club? What do you, what do you think? Honestly, it's all about the vibe. Like, it just depends on if people are feeling it, and, like really getting down. Like, that was amazing because it was rain and people just didn't care that they were just there for the music and there to party. You know what I mean? Like, that, that, whether it's a club, small, big, it doesn't matter to me. But yeah, as far as small clubs and stuff like that, I dread them now because of COVID. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, sweaty, <laughs> close room on top of each other. Yeah, don't breathe on me, bro. Like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so yeah, I've got that in the back of my mind. I used to love those rooms and I still do as a DJ. But like we we have we have one of my favorite moments of ours is one of them is when we were we had a, a quarterly residency in Rotterdam at Toffler, and it's a low ceiling club and it's an old bicycle tunnel. So like you're on a stage and it's sized up for 200 people, and then once it hits 200 people, then it, on a high draw lift moves back 50 yards, and then 200 more people come in. By the time you're at six in the morning, because we played an eight hour set. By the time it's six in the morning, there's 900 people in this bicycle tunnel. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, totally incredible. And, and again, it's, it's low ceilings and a packed tight tube. So, like, the vibe is just absolutely incredible. But it's also, <laughs> yeah. it's also fun playing for 50,000 people, too. Like, that's, I'm not going to say that that's terrible because, like, I almost feel like unless you're an absolute terrible DJ – that's the only way to have a terrible set with a huge system and a huge live show and a huge yeah. crowd. Like you, you have to be, you have to go out of your way to be terrible to like ruin that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. I, I think, you know what I mean? If you're good enough to be on the stage, you're going to have a good set. I, I think so. It's a little bit more room. I would say a little bit more room for error, but I also think that we structure those sets a little bit more than we do the in club sets. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. No, I, it's something that some other guys, when I've asked that question, have kind of said is, and I think from a fan perspective, it's hard to understand. But like, you know, when you're playing a festival or one of these mega stages or whatever, it's like, you have 60 minutes, and it's a hard cap. And so like, you really need to know what you're doing, even if I'm not saying, you know, you're gonna plan everything out. But like, you kind of need to understand where you're starting and where you're ending. Um, yeah, you guys, you guys mentioned it just kind of in alluding to that, you know, there's so much more talent these days, but as veterans of the scene, I'm just wondering kind of what things you've noticed that have changed in the house and techno scene throughout your lifetime and kind of in the last few years, what you've really been aware of. Um, I think <clears throat> one thing that I've noticed is unless the parties like, unless the crowd's really vibing what's going on in the nineties, you could play a 12 minute record. <clears throat> and there would be a change of a hi-hat and the crowd would blow up. <laughs> Nowadays, I don't think people listen as clearly. I don't think they listen to like the, the, the directors. I mean, you got to remember like in the nineties, this is America's first chance of really hearing dance music ever. You know what I mean? So like people were really like astounded and people were doing drugs for their first time, I think too. So like, I think, I, I think people were just like really listening. And I think nowadays you don't have that as much, but you do when it's a really good part. Like I felt like, Every movement that I did at the uh, at the Brooklyn Mirage from the beginning to the end down to Chris Lake, people are watching every movement, every everything. And that, that you had a very intuitive crowd there. Like not every crowd is like that these days. So that's a big difference. I, I think that I think ADD and all these things that have formed over the years, I think has created some sort of an issue where people don't focus as much. You know what I mean? And it's yeah, like, and it's really spent like, that's why we thought this gig was so special is because I felt like from beginning to end, the kids were very paying attention from beginning to end. You know, if I would hit the effects processor and they drop it, like the crowd was going nuts. That doesn't happen at every venue. You know what I mean? So like, I definitely think there's that that's the gate between the nineties and the two thousands is not every time do you get a huge uh, response to just little movements on the mixer and stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and then I, you know, obviously technology has created a whole new situation to where like <clears throat> as a performer, <clears throat> I feel like I feel safer on the decks. 
than I did when I was on turntables. Like, yeah. I mean, dude, you would no have feedback. Yeah, you would have go-go <laughs> dancers jumping up and down. You're just like, oh my God, yeah. there's 10,000. The needle, the needle bumps. Yeah. I, I have yeah. it on video one time where a beach ball came flying in, hit the turntable, the tone arm, went up in the air and came back down in the middle of the blend and it landed on me. <laughs> <laughs> I have, it, I have it. I have it on video, and the best part is Armand and Helen standing right behind me, being like, "Damn!" <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it's cool, man. But you know, like there, there was, there, like I said, there's so many differences between then and now. But I, I, I really like what's going on now. I felt like we embraced the technology. Like we're in our studio now. We have three thousands. We have the V mixer for pioneer which i think if anyone's listening and, and it's the you're asking what a v10 is it's the newest mixer from pioneer that's got six channels and for a duo it's incredible because it's got two headphone jacks so yeah, like that runs separately we're not sponsored by pioneer we're not pushing <laughs> yeah. anything but <laughs> let's get that sponsor though <laughs> yeah but, but we do have that sponsor and we are pushing it you know? <laughs> No, but for oh, that mixer is incredible, though, because I can listen to stuff in the mixer that he doesn't have to listen to so that we're not stuck taking turns. We could actually both work at the same time as a duo. So we're really excited oh, about that feature. Yeah. Yes, it's really awesome. Like, where that gives us the opportunity to lay acapellas and all and put loops, beat loops yeah, and all yeah. kinds of different things. So you're not just hearing a track. You know, that's the one thing in our performance. We like everyone to think like especially I, I had one of my buddies there who we did a collab with. And I purposely started from the middle of the record with a loop of it and then came back to the beginning of it. And he was like, is that like a different version of it? I'm like, no, I'm just using all this equipment to make that sound different. Totally. You know? So oh, that's it's awesome. fun to manipulate. I didn't know about I think, that it was, I think it was harder to do that. I think it was harder to do that with vinyl back in the day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just wondering, just because you mentioned you have them, it seems like the response to the CDJ 3000 has been really amazing. I mean, when we did this Chris Lake show, like he was like, I need the 3000s and we're kind of seeing it on the promoter side, like everyone wants them. What What's different about it? And what is it that's like so special about this new version? So for all of us older DJs, <laughs> the screen's bigger. You know? <laughs> it's almost in Braille. <laughs> No, but yeah. <laughs> no, this the screen is way bigger and way brighter. So when you're in a dark situation, it's like you're not you're in a bright room. It feels like because you can see the wave clearly. There's so many features. To search functions a lot easier. You don't have to go back, back, back. You just hit search and you can search a track rather than you know the other with the 2000 Nexus twos. It's like you have to like go back, go back, go back, and then search separately so, so that's certain nice. searching features nice yeah. and for me i'm a turntablist i scratch yeah it's actually weighted better than the other cdjs ever so it actually feels like a turntable when i'm scratching like i can actually feel it like it's going back and forth on the other ones it's very plastic you know what i mean this one actually feels like a turntable platter so oh, that, that's oh, what I'm, i like no it's i, I honestly was selfishly asking I, i'm like DJ, I, it's, I think it's like maybe you can relate like every promoter really just wishes they were a dj that's kind of my thing and mm -hmm. i i'm playing a show this friday and we're using cdj 3000s and i've literally never touched them so i'm like a little nervous about it but i wanted to kind of jump forward and ask you guys mm -hmm. about um future funk um you know it felt like a bit of a, a breakout track and you know there's i mean there's all these like crazy videos of Solomon at some like 12 hour Ibiza after party playing it. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm wondering, you know, when you're in the studio and you, you put a track out like that, you know, do you guys kind of look at each other and you know, like this one is really special or did that take you by surprise the response to it? So when we made it, we really thought it was, we, we tried to make it special specifically because we were trying to impress Green Velvet. We, we, that originally was shopped to, to Relief Records and we never got a response. So I was like, we spent way too, many, too much time on this record to just not shelf put it out. It. Yeah, to <laughs> shelf it. So uh, we happen to have a good relationship with DJ Pierre, the guy who created Acid House. And uh, we do a party with him at ADE every year. And uh we sent it to him and he was like, love it. Let's put it out. And then through his platform, he pushed it. We got a huge banner on B port 
and it did nothing. It was a total belly flop. The record actually did horrible, but it would kill it in our sets. We were like, I, I don't get it. Beatport gave it a big banner. It was everything you could dream for as a producer. <laughs> yeah. Like it all aligned. And then a year and a half later, I get a message. I was, it was like four in the morning. I just happened to be on my phone and it says, hey. And I was like, what is this? It's our fan page. I go, what's this? It's some kid from Tel Aviv. And he was like, is this your record? And he sends me a video of like a hundred thousand people losing their shit to this record. And I was like, oh uh, yeah, who's that? He's like, Solomon just dropped your record. And I had checked real quick on Shazam and we, yeah. were, we were still only at like a thousand Shazams. That. The next morning I checked the Shazam again and we were at 30,000 Shazams on that record. Oh my <laughs> like God. there was, everyone had their phones up trying to figure out what the record was. Cause apparently it was the highlight of the set. And the video came up that next morning on his Instagram. And this is back when you could see how many likes were on Instagram. Right. And this guy puts it up. He says, thank you. Tel Aviv didn't tag us. He's like, thank you. Tel Aviv for an incredible event. This is an epic moment for my set. Thank you so much. I'm blown away with the response. And it was 257,000 likes. I was like, what in the God's yeah. creation? <laughs> who is, first of all, I didn't really know a lot about Solomon. I go, who is this guy? Like, I knew his music, but I didn't realize he was that big. I had no clue. Yeah. You know, in America, it doesn't translate so much, not in the cities that we grew up in. You know what I mean? So then I started researching and realizing how big this guy was. And then, like, the record all of a sudden went from being dead to hit the top 10 on B-Port because this guy played our record. And all of a sudden we jumped to 500,000 plays on Spotify. So like you're saying, it, it, it's funny because like, in America, it, people still relatively don't know this record. Like it's funny. And it's like, it's huge in Europe. Tale of Us is playing it. Dixon's playing it. Like all these people yeah. that most of them won't even respond to my emails. Like I've hit Dixon like probably 30 <laughs> times and say, thank you. He knows he doesn't care. He's yeah. like, yeah, ghetto blaster who, whatever. Yeah, dude, I play your record. So what? <laughs> so then, you know what I mean? And, and if you're watching this, bro, thanks for playing my record. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, but Solomon actually reached out. He said, great record guys. And then he started playing a couple of our other tunes. So that was the one that grabbed his attention. So, and I'm sure a lot of our stuff isn't for him, but one out of 10 records, he, he's, he's, giving us a thumbs up. So that just accidentally caught on. And that's super cool. I'm glad that you know that record. Cause I feel like that's something that everyone will be playing in Europe. Everyone asks us yeah. about the record here. You're the first person to ask about it. Yeah, so <laughs> super cool. No, that's fun. It's funny. Cause I think my experience around it was almost similar to what you guys are describing. We're like, I think I was tangentially aware of you guys as an act. And, and a couple of years ago, same kind of thing. I'm just on Instagram and I see, and as I mentioned, like, you know, I just DJ for fun. And so like, I, I'm always downloading music and like, I just see some video of him. It could have even been from that show, to be honest. I mean, like him dropping it at some huge place. And I'm just like, what the fuck is this? And you listen to it. And I mean, it's like, it's, it's just a banger, but uh, I'm glad you, it's kind of an interesting thing. Cause as you just mentioned, it's like, it's this line where some people are into it. Some people aren't. Have you noticed, you know, as people, as guys who have been around for a while, do you feel like the scene in Europe versus the scene here have kind of gotten closer over the years? Or do you think there's still a bit of a divide? So with our music, it's different because we're a little bit more closer to the roots of what Chicago and Detroit houses with, with a hybrid We're we're a hybrid. So we get reactions first over there. And then out of the 10 records that get reactions there, the biggest one will get big here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. it's, it's for us, because like I said, eclectically, like we get thrown into a category of like the tracky stuff and the more warehouse style music, which is more appealing to Europe for some reason, because here we have hip hop and commercial. And this is why we interject actual lyrics to it. And when we put lyrics into our tracks, then the Europeans hate it. Hmm. They want our tracks with no words. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I don't know how many reviews I've gotten back. Like we, <laughs> we actually just did one right now that we had Gerd Jensen and DJ Hell giving us huge reviews. There's not a vocal in sight on these tracks. But the second we add a vocal, I always get an email. Hey, can I get a version of this with no words? 
like I get from, and it's always a European, you know what I mean? It's really funny. Like, yeah. it's, it's like, but in America, the words work better because of hip hop culture and pop culture here. So like, it, I mean, not that they don't have that culture there, but it's way bigger here. So, so when we interject lyrics to our tracks, it's because we live in America, you know what I mean? But like lately we've been like on our VIP promos, we're giving inter- instrumentals for our European friends. So there is a little bit of a divide for us on that, but we, we play both markets though. So that's, that's the kind of cool thing about that. So. That's funny. Yeah. I, I, I mean, just, I was just thinking about that club you're describing the bicycle place. And I mean, it's just a different scene over there. I know I, I had an experience in Berlin at Tresor and it's like, Oh yeah. You just look, you look around and it's like four in the morning and you're like, oh, I'm, I'm in like a subway station right now or something yeah. like, and the party just started. Word. <laughs> yeah, the party just started. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, people aren't really ready for words when like the sun comes out. Um, you our know, first you time guys... in Bulgaria. Our first time in Bulgaria. We we got there. We landed at eleven. Promoters like, oh, you got time to like shower. You don't go on till twelve thirty. All right, cool. And we get there. I go, hey, how long are we playing for? He was like, oh, I paid you a lot of money. You're gonna play till the morning. I was like, well, he's like, eight or nine. Is that okay? <laughs> I'm like, dude, I've been playing eight hours set. I wish you would have gave me the heads up a little bit, bro. Like, oh, yeah, I can oh do it. God. I'm like, holy shit, okay. But and it's funny because the club is so big and goes for so long. You see waves of people. Like your crowd at six in the morning is not the same crowd that was there at midnight. They're there for a few hours. They leave, and there's a line that's constantly rotating all night. It's so crazy. But yeah. Wow. When you guys have a set like that, whether you're ready for it or not, um, what does that night look like for you? Both kind of in like the flow of DJing and then also just from a physical perspective, like, are you ever like, I'm, I need a snack right now. Like gotta go to the bathroom. Like how's I'm, de- that I'm definitely pissed in a garbage can in the booth before. <laughs> <laughs> There's that. <laughs> Usually food's not an option unless it's yeah. in our rider. And as far as that goes, I try to pace the drinking out a little bit more. <laughs> same, yeah. Yeah, same thing with track. <laughs> I'm, I'm a serious note though. Like I could, at an eight hour set, I could play the tracks out a little bit. You know what I mean? I don't have to feel like you know, the power hour. Like the other night we played for an hour. It was like, we had to get ghetto blaster across the minds of kids in 60 minutes. You know what I mean? Right. Versus eight hours. You know what I mean? So like, I, I, I I don't know how you feel about this. I I feel like when we do a longer set, we dip into our influences a little bit more. Classics. Yeah. We some classics, bring some classics back and forth, like some records from five years ago that we loved because we, we have our folders stacked in like so we, we we do gig folders like for we have one that says brooklyn mirage and then there's brooklyn mirage select select so like i have a, a bunch of tracks that i pick and then i have these tracks that if i'm retarded and i can't come up with anything to play these are all my favorite records in this little folder you know what i mean <laughs> but I ha- so, and then I could navigate outside of that if I feel comfortable, I don't feel pressured. You know what I mean? But then I have all these old folders. So like, not only am I setting up a folder for that gig, but I'm like, Oh, back when we were in, you know, San Francisco, I got a San Francisco folder here. I remember this record worked real well, pull that out. Like I have it strategized to where we have all our gig folders on the same drive. And then we have like all our records. And then we have the one specifically for that gig. So, yeah. so I got it's you. fun. Well, so it's interesting because I, you know, I've asked, like I, I recently interviewed both um, Josh Butler and Bontan and, you know, they play back to back together a lot and they just played in New York actually last weekend. And so I was just asking them about kind of, you know, what's that process like? How do you interchange off each other for you guys as, you know, DJ who is a duo all the time? What is that process like when you're playing? Is it you're playing a song, he's playing a song or is it a little more collaborative? Sometimes both. Mm-hmm. So, sometimes it's like I'm pouring the drink and he's playing the tracks or sometimes he's pouring the drink and I'm <laughs> playing the tracks. And then sometimes it's like, yo, that sounds dope. Loop that. And then I bring this acapella in and I bring in a new track. Sometimes at, at Brooklyn, we've had, we had four decks going at one point. Yeah. Like, yeah. so like I, I, we try to treat it almost like a uh, tractor. Like, like some, some of these guys do like four stuff on tractor. We try to treat the CDJs the same way where we like try to layer stuff. Whether you could tell or not, I don't know, but that's the idea is for you not to be able to tell. And and I, I like the idea of people holding their phones up and shazamming and because it's layered, they're like, what is this? Yeah. Like, I, I love that. We, we try to play a lot of unreleased music too. And re- recently, <laughs> your phone's talking to you, bro. <laughs> recently, we, uh, yeah, recently, we actually had to like yell at each other. I was like, 
we need to play our records that are out right now because we played them for so long unreleased. I was like, dude, we have to promote what's going on because like, I feel like we're light years ahead of what comes out on Beatport, if that makes sense. You know, like we're probably, I mean, I'm, I'm producing records and signing things that are coming out next year that are like not even going to come out this year right now. So yeah. like, it's, it's like we had the, re- like we did a release, we have a release coming on Black Book. We have another one coming on DJ Pierre's label. We're starting our own label, coming a new label. coming. We, we had a label before, and we're still running that label, but we're starting a new one called Aliens on Mushrooms. So <laughs> That's just kind of a, Yeah, just a fun party type thing, but it's, it's going to be a little bit more uh, serious. It's going to be a little bit less... Uh, like corny like not that we do corny stuff on our other stuff but we kind of let the we let no rules on the other label this one it's like it's we want it to be a little bit more pro as far as like long shelf life we don't make quick records this is going to be like we our first one is us and roland clark on a record it's an acid house record we put a lot into it we made sure it was all done on analog gear we, we want to make sure it has a 20 year shelf life so 20 years from now we want to play that record again you know what i mean so that's how we we designed that and then we have remixes for inner city and we have remixes from a mean edge and dance on that record so that's our first one to launch the label like we're super excited about that and that that wow. one we did one with dj funk coming that chris dropped it on uh friday at, at brooklyn mirage it was the booty shake record that he played that one it lit up the crowd it was awesome i was like and that's when we were like fuck we gotta put this record out yeah. for, we forgot about it you know what i mean like we did it so long I mean, ago. yeah it was what two and a half we, we did it two years ago because we did we did two records with dj funk the first one came out on dirty bird and then with the extra vocals we did another track <laughs> and then we never put it out oh my so god never put it out, so yeah well, I'm glad you just mentioned it because you guys have a pretty tremendous output over the years. I mean, I think um, in this year, at least so far, you've put out about like 20 tracks or something like that. I'm just wondering, you know, is that a is that a conscious effort or do you guys just love being in the studio and it's so it's kind of just a no brainer? We were fourth in pandemic, so we had no choice but to sit in the studio. So we wrote 125 tracks last year. Wow. So we actually don't have to make music for 10 years right now. We don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we obviously were enticed by producing. We love, I, we were working on music last night till six in the morning. I, I was actually tough to wake up for this right now because we, we stayed up all night. When we, kept, when we catch a groove, we just keep producing. So it's like, we don't even think about it. So, but as far as that goes, yeah, we, we have a bucket list of labels we want to be on. And I think we executed about 98% of them right now, like from glitter box to defected to dirty bird to, to um, was it uh, desert hearts to, to all across the board, you know, DFTD uh, basement leak now black book. Like we, we, we love all these, lab- all these labels, everything that everything we're signed to, we play records off those labels. So like we're super stoked about that. As far as structure, I don't know if we we're, we we're trying to, but it's just kind of happening out of boredom, pretty much. <laughs> There's not a lot to do in Michigan. <laughs> so. We actually kind of slowed down our releases a little bit from when we first started. We we're pushing them up, pushing them up, pushing them up. Yeah, we had a release every week for a year one time. Mm-hmm. Wow. Maybe even more. I mean, even recently, we've had a couple where it was like three. Stacked, yeah. Some of these labels, they don't care about each other. They're so rude to each other. Like, we did something for Sony Australia. We did something with this guy in Germany and a guy with another label. Like, oh, we're doing this date. I'm like, ah, can you not all put up <laughs> on the same day? <laughs> but, but what's cool about that, though, is the ones get like 100,000 plays on Spotify. The other one got played on BBC Radio. So we'll have like five like wins in one day. It's so weird. But like none of it, it's structured, but it's not structured. We try to structure it, but people don't give a fuck what we're trying to do. And they, they will stop on all our plants, <laughs> but it's okay though. We love them all. We, we do like all the labels. Like I said, all the labels that we, we fuck with, we love them all. Like not, down to like everything on DJ Pierre's label to the Dirty Bird guys. Like they're all great. They're all such good people. Space Disco, our friend Hateris in Toronto, like, but we, we love the disco side of things. We don't, we actually try not to do release too many disco records because we do like that a lot, but we don't want to be known as disco house guys. So we try to sprinkle it in with our other music. So that, well, that was going forward for you guys, obviously, you know, I wanted to ask about kind of if there were labels that you wanted to be on, but you answered that. And I'm just wondering, you know, it seems like you've checked a lot of boxes, but obviously you're still grinding, you're still playing shows. 
kind of what's next for you guys and you know do you have any goals or things that you're really like hoping to achieve in the next couple of years this year coming up we're going to start implementing a little bit more music videos we did that with hose and that was that was kind of like our big record this year that was the one that we had a few big records this year but that was the one that was the breakthrough that hit number one on Port for eight weeks and it stayed in the top 10 for 24 weeks and it's still in the top 30 right now, like since February. So like, that was like that we did a music video. We did the right promotion behind it. So what we're trying to do is we're slowing our releases down a little bit and we're trying to put more effort into really getting the records with vocals known more with music videos and PR and all this other stuff. Because before it was like, you could put blindfolds on me and this guy, give us a handful of darts. We're trying to hit bullseyes. And we were just putting records out because we love making music. Like you said, we, we have a huge output and I, I want to keep the output as big as far as from the studio. I may not release as many of them because I feel like out of 20 records, there's two that are the breakthrough records. So what we're trying to do is we're trying not to release all of them, basically. And we're trying to release the ones that we think are the better ones that we want to finagle and spend more time on. So we really want to kind of like make a bigger presence on on uh, YouTube and maybe MTV. The MTVs that play videos. <laughs> like, I know the MTV in America doesn't do that. But uh, we want to try to implement that kind of stuff a little bit more, maybe license our music into more movies and commercials and stuff, because we, we were having success with that, but we've never really went after that before. So we're trying to maybe more on the business side, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. But we, but we want to continue the output that we're doing, though, because there's nothing more fun than like like right now. If I didn't make three records over the last week, I wouldn't want to go play my four gigs this weekend. You know what I mean? Like this weekend, I feel like I got to test these records out, you know, like it, yeah. it's so much fun to do that, you know? Absolutely. Is there anyone that's kind of on the come up or you just think is maybe a little like flying under the radar that you guys are really listening to a lot? Oh wow! There's so, much. There's, there's so many. I, 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 it's I, tough. I, I do it is so hard. Like we, 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 one thing that we're trying to do since we've kind of got a little bit of a buzz, we're trying to work with everyone that we really like. So, like, so there are a handful of people that I think are really dope, but it's like it's hard to just name one or two. Like, there's people out there I wish did, did more stuff. They're like, there's people out there that are really big that I, that I'm good friends with that I wish they put out more music, but it seems like their cap, like their manager wants them to do one record and then tour for six weeks. And I'm like, no, you got to put records out as much as I do because I love your shit <laughs> that much. And I'll, I'll, I won't say any names, but like there's just some people I wish put out more records, man, you know? So it's like, I think that's one of the reasons why we're putting out so many records is because there's no way my manager will ever tell me don't put out music. I'm like, yeah, you have a job because I put out music. Don't ever tell me not to put out music, bro. <laughs> Like, you know what I mean? Like, I, I really want to make sure that we don't put a cap on our talent. Like, you know what I mean? And as far as people out there, dude, it's so hard. Like, everyone who played the party was incredible. Clooney was awesome. Like, I would love to do a record with the Egyptian Lover. I don't, even, I don't even know if we can even get that to happen, but you know him. So if you can yeah, plug up with the Egyptian I'll, Lover, bro. <laughs> I'll connect you guys, no problem. Yeah, no, he's incredible, man. Like, you know, and I like taking like like right now we have we have records with a bunch of old school DJs and producers. Like, love working with the mentality of hardware and then bringing them into software. You know, I mean, it's really cool. Yeah, you know? it was awesome seeing him kind of take a different approach. You know, DJing with the vinyl and really giving us like a breakbeat set and. You know, I think I think that the crowd was initially like kind of what's going on and then they bought into a little more and yeah. it was just cool. Like, I think, you know, we don't really see a lot of acts like that playing anymore. And Chris, you know, his team, they wanted they really wanted to have kind of older, more legendary acts be playing before him. And whether it was him or Kevin Saunderson the night before, I mean, yeah, yeah. I think it's really refreshing and it's important for kind of the younger generation of fans to know these roots and like know where these guys came from. We, we there was a moment we were standing back there. I go, look, bro, no records. That guy's straight up on his nine oh nine and rapping. Like, yeah. dude, I, I go, they don't even know that. The yeah. crowd has no idea what's really going on, but we do. Yeah. And this is fucking special. This is really cool, man. You know, so that's why, yeah. like, that's why your guys' party really on many levels was really cool for us. It's very inspiring. So. Well, I'm, I'm really happy to hear that. Um, I, I really just had one question left for you guys, which was, you know, you mentioned him earlier, but I saw you guys chatting with Tommy Sunshine uh, at the show. And obviously, you know, you guys have known him for a while. 
Yeah. He's one of these people that I know for me, when I was coming up, I was kind of just like, oh, he's like the dude playing at 2 p.m. like on the main stage at Ultra. But yeah. he obviously, you know, is a bit of a figure in this scene. Could you just tell us a little bit about him? For I don't know what your experience with him is, but he lived in he came from Chicago originally. So like when I've seen him the very first time I seen Tommy, I was like, who is this guy with fluorescent red leather pants going on stage? <laughs> I mean, like, literally, I was like, dude, yeah, super tight high. pants. I go, man, it is a hundred degrees in this warehouse, and this dude has leather pants. He's got to have the muskiest <laughs> balls in this room right now. <laughs> like, <laughs> I was like, who is this guy? And then he just went up there and just crushed it. I was like, holy shit. And then I started figuring out who he was. And I found out he was working at a record label out of Chicago uh, called Dust Tracks. And Dust Tracks was like a umbrella for like Joey Baltram's label, DJ Dan's label, Felix the House Cat's label, Paul oh, Johnson's yeah. label, and all these other people. And he worked there with, with those people. So he was very in tune with all the hottest dudes in dance music, you know. And I just kept seeing him over and over like he was just a, he was just a superstar man like he was a superstar dj like i i didn't have any of his records or nothing i just seen him headlining rave parties non-stop and i was like i'm not gonna wear leather pants but i want to be up there too <laughs> <laughs> you know so and, and tommy's always had like the cutting edge look like just standing with him tommy you flex it bro like whatever you got going on you gotta teach me that mojo bro because it's incredible but like he's such a good guy knows his yeah. music he's just been around forever man he's, he's been part of the rave scene since the beginning days of america and he's that's why the after the rave documentary that he has on netflix so awesome that he did that because like he's one of the guys who was there when daft punk played the first time in, in Wisconsin, I was there in the crowd, but he was there as one of the DJs playing with these guys. So he's seen the evolution of Justice, Daft Punk, like all of them, Chris Lake, everybody. He, Tommy's been there through all of it. So that's why I like that's him about Tommy. Tommy's just been there forever, man. And he knows that, it, it, like he even said, he was like, man, he was like having you guys, he said this on Twitter. He was like having Ghetto Blaster in town for three days my friends from chicago he was like it was incredible to be able to talk shop and and talk to people who've been there the whole time as well so like he doesn't get to talk to people that have seen that for so long it's cool like we just reminisce of like chicago that stuck on earth parties in new york like we just he's been there for all of them and so have i so it's really cool to just be able to at, at a different level though because i was younger so like i was a kid going to these things you know what i mean so he was an adult so like it, it's definitely we're on different wavelengths there's a little bit of a gap between our ages but but it's cool though. like i said he's just he's a he's a book of history that's it's, it's amazing like no but just to talk to him if you you ever get a chance to interview him you should do that because yeah. that, that'd be a good interview he, he definitely has some yeah. stories man absolutely Before maybe just I... hanging out with thomas bengalter from daft punk just he, let, letting him tell the stories of how like they used to master all their music on a boom box <laughs> so like that, and this ghetto blaster part of our reason we call ourselves ghetto blasters because of that story and like our initial goal as Ghetto Blaster was, if you ever heard the the homework album by Daft Punk, have you ever heard this before? Yeah, of course. You know the song Teachers? Yeah. Okay, so they shoot out a bunch of DJs. Our goal was to work with everyone that they named. So like <laughs> we've gotten halfway through the list, actually. So oh my God, wow. About 50% of those people, maybe 60% at this point. So like that, that was our goal. And I was like, hey, man, if we can get 10% through this list, we're going to go somewhere. Well, now we're at 60% touring the world. So I go, man, we, if we finish this list, <laughs> you know, so, but it was just like that's a little amazing. goal for us. You know what I mean? So. Crazy. That's awesome. Well, that's a great story. I'll have to get Tommy Sunshine on next. Uh, you guys connect me with him. I'll connect you with Greg of Egyptian lover. And uh, I want to show you I'm, something. I want to show you something. Real yeah. Quick. Yeah. Hold on. Check this out. Ah! I'll never get to bust this out. We just happen to be in the studio. <laughs> This is where my roots come from. I used to sell thousands of these things. Oh my god! <laughs> and for Live those of you that are watching this, story. <laughs> and for, for those of you watching this, if you don't know what this is, this is called the cassette. <laughs> you stick this in a stereo and you press play. And there's yeah. music on this shit. <laughs> but I sold twenty thousand copies of this. Why I tattooed it right here on my arm. So <laughs> that's great. Oh I found god. this in my storage unit. How crazy is that? <laughs> 
That's really funny. I, I, yeah, it's, you don't see those too often anymore. I was actually like buying some vinyl a couple months ago and I was on Discogs and like I accidentally, or I was trying to order this Dirty Bird compilation and I guess I wasn't really paying attention and, yeah. I, and it arrives and it was just like a triple CD. And I'm just oh, like, shit. I was like, <laughs> what? Like, why is Dirty Bird making CDs? Like, it was just so, it was such a throwback oh, for me, but. That was pretty good. Like, these it was are pretty funny. cool. You're like, these are pretty cool coasters. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You got to send me your address. I'll mail you some vinyl because we're starting to put out vinyl too. So, oh, that would be amazing. Thank you so much. I would love that. Um, and you we're, know, thinking about all, you doing, know, we're thinking about doing this for our fans too. We're thinking about actually making cassettes and then being like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> yeah. Know? Dude, I, I don't know if this is public information but whatever i know that skrillex is doing that um with like his next drop so people are into it i mean i think there's yeah. a market there for it but uh we'll connect on email after and get yeah. all of it going really awesome. glad we could make this happen just want to say thank you guys again for taking the time this was awesome uh thanks for having us we'll back man. yeah hopefully we'll get you back in new york again soon would love it man yeah. we had such a good time with you guys your whole team is amazing yeah that was awesome well you guys Not have a problem. great day you too, man. You too, man. See you later. Later.